The second song that we sing is Spirit of the Living God, which we're going to sing as a prayer. So it's going to be without accompaniment. So I didn't want you to be surprised when you didn't hear Natalie play it. Let's sing this. sing that song with just using our, our voices, our breath, we can, we can hear the, the hiss and it reminds us of the presence of your Lord. Lord, I pray that, that your spirit would indeed empower this church, that you might create an awakening inside of us, that we might emerge as your people, that we might bring light where there has been darkness, that we might lift up and share the hope of Jesus Christ where people have been filled with hopelessness. Lord, we pray for the uplifting power of your spirit, that it would fill us up, that it might spill out into the lives of those that we come in contact with. May we feel that power and presence today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Morning, kids. I brought this, I pulled it up out of our, our yard on the way over here. You know what you call this? A windmill. And it's a windmill, a whirly gig, a pinwheel. You see these things spin. What makes these things spin right here? The wind. I, they're kind of heavy, so I tried. <laughs> I can just barely get it to move. I don't quite have enough wind. But on a really windy day, these things would get to flying. Uh, in, uh, in Wilson, you can see a, a bunch of these that are handmade and really big. There's a place uh, called the Whirly Gig Park. Have you ever seen any, any of those in Wilson? If not, yeah, ask, ask an adult to take you there because that's uh, quite a sight to see. You can go outside and see these, these neat Whirly Gigs blowing the wind. And then this reminds me of uh, windmills that have been around for years. People used to build giant windmills and, and when they would turn, they would harness that power to do things like grind grain. And, uh, and now we're still using windmills. Uh, there are, are giant windmills that generate electricity you know, as we try to find different ways to, to harness energy and, and, and conserve our resources. That's one way. Out in the, the Midwest, there are areas where, where you got just tons and tons of these windmills. They're all harnessing electricity. So whether it's grinding grain or whether it's electricity, that means that, that the wind is being harnessed and that the wind is a source of power for these uh, for these devices and the reason I brought that up is because today is a very special Sunday it's called Pentecost can I hear you say Pentecost, Pentecost. that's right Pentecost uh, it, it's a it's a, a it started as a Jewish festival and it became known as the birthday of the church because something very special took place on Pentecost it says that the church was gathered in a room and then there was something heard that was like uh, the howling of wind that blew into that room. And when that wind blew into that room, people were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started speaking. They started preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, but not only in their own language, because they were empowered by the Spirit, they started preaching in languages that they had never even spoken. Can you imagine if, if uh, all of a sudden I just started speaking in, in French or in German and preaching the, the gospel and you're looking around like, why is Pastor Phil speaking a language? And then you look and who's coming in the door? But here comes a, uh, a French person and here comes a German person. Well, that's what took place. You see, during Pentecost, uh, there were so many people that came from the Jewish festival that the streets were crowded. And when they heard all the noise by this wind-powered, spirit-powered preaching that was going on, it drew them in. And they went into the room and they all began to hear the gospel preached in their own language. So that's what we celebrate on this day called Pentecost Sunday. It's when the church got its start. Jesus, as we talked about last week, had ascended into heaven. He had given them the mission. And it, it was uh, evident on that day that the, the church would be wind powered. Not wind as in the, the wind outside, but wind as in God's spirit. Because the, the Greek word for wind and spirit and breath all come from the same basic Greek word. So, uh, you know, so, so that, you know, that was like God breathed on the people and said, you are going to be my disciples. You're going to be my witnesses here and throughout the world. Let us think about that as we go to our Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, we are a church, and that means that we need to be filled with your spirit. We need to be preaching your good news. We as individual members need to be doing all we can outside of these church walls to draw people in that they might hear that good news. Lord, we pray that we would be uh, wind-powered and that, that we would be powered by your spirit, that your spirit would breathe on us and breathe in us and, uh, and that, that our life would come from, from you, that you would uh, fill us with your spirit, that we might experience life lived to the fullest, that we might experience the joy that comes from our relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Out of that joy, may we be witnesses. May we create an attractive witness that draws people to you as we uh, invite people to church, Lord. May, may they come and, and hear the good news preached. Lord, we pray that your, that your spirit would fall upon us and, 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 and invigorate us. May we get excited about your kingdom, about what you're doing in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our children are now dismissed for children's church. We're going to hear exactly what took place in the Gospel of Acts by listening in to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. Well, if you made it here today, that means you had enough gas in your tank to get here. That's a good thing, right? Something that we might have taken for granted a few weeks ago. But as we saw gas stations running out, as we saw lines, the, the Shell station down the road, there was a, a line that started from the Shell station and backed up all the way to, uh, to Sheets. And I think that's because they, they were figuring out Sheets had run out and they were getting in line to go to Shell. It's been crazy. Uh, it was due to that, the, you know, the hacker that just disrupted the whole you know, delivery system. Luckily, that has all been sorted out and things are starting to go back to normal. Uh, I was able to get gas this week without any trouble. I hope you work as well. But it's really made you think uh, twice about, uh, about making sure that your tank is full. There are really two types of people in this world. There are those who never let their car get below a half a tank. And then there are those that like to see just how far they can go on that last quarter of tank. And then you got these lights that come on and tell you, and some of them even have countdown miles. Oh, look, I've still got nine miles to go. You better be careful when you, it says that because that nine miles depends on how hard you press the accelerator and, and stop and go traffic and things like that. You might get caught short if you're not careful, and lots of people were. I saw cars that were sitting at gas stations, and you think, oh, they got gas, and then you realize there's nobody in those cars. I don't know exactly what happened, but I assume people just barely made it to the gas station, found out they didn't have any gas, and had to just abandon their cars until the pumps filled back up. Another person I saw in the news was trying to get to the gas station and uh, ran out on the way. So he had to walk to his cousin's house and they hopped in their car, had the gas can with them, and they drove about halfway to where the car was and they ran out of gas on his cousin's car. And then they're both walking down the street with gas cans in hand, going to the, uh, the gas station to try to get enough gas to get both of their cars home. It has been interesting. It makes you uh, appreciate the, the privilege of being able to get here and there without worrying uh, that we, we do most of the time. When, uh, when I was a young person, I had a 66 Mustang. Yeah, I, I miss that car, isn't it pretty? But there's one thing about that Mustang. That last quarter was a mystery. You, you never knew exactly where it would run out. It would never quite make it to empty. You know, when it got down to that last quarter, it would just stop moving. And so you just had to guess, you know, how far have I been since it hit the quarter? I did have a habit of keeping a, a gallon gas tank, a gas can in the trunk of the car because I'm not one of those people that I mentioned earlier that makes sure they never get below a half a tank. There were times when I got caught by surprise and had to fill the, you know, the car up uh, with, with gas. I, I see Jessica nodding her head already because she's remembering the time that it embarrassed her the most. It was on a Sunday, just like today. I had just joined her family, went, went to church with her parents, sat on the same row with them. And uh, Jessica got in my car and her parents were following. So we were leaving church. We were going to get some food after the service. And all of a sudden, I start pulling over. And her parents are like, what is he pulling over for? And I pull into a little gravel spot beside the road. I hop out. I pop my trunk. I get my little gallon of gas. <laughs> and I fill up in my Sunday best. Uh, wear my good clothes. I fill up the, uh, you know, the, the car with that gallon. Throw it, throw it in, shut the trunk, hop in, and just start driving like it was no thing. I didn't even think twice about it. And you know, when I get in, you know, Jessica's got her hand in her palm, you know, just so embarrassed. My dad is one of those never below a half tank guys too. So. <laughs> Did you hear that? Her, her dad never lets it get below a half a tank. So I'm sure that made a really good first impression. This is the person he's trusting his daughter with and I can't even keep the car full of gas. Um, 
what I have learned from that experience and what I have been reminded yet again from our recent uh, gas crisis is that without fuel, you're not going anywhere. You've got to have gas in the car. And uh, I bring that up on this Sunday of all Sundays because this Sunday is about the filling of the Holy Spirit. That we are filled individually, that we as a church are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it's a pretty logical uh, connection there that we as a church, we are not going to get anywhere unless we are filled with God's Spirit. Uh, Jesus explained this to them before he was ascended as, uh, as we talked about last Sunday. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. For the gift of my father, my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So wait, and you are going to be filled up. And it's not until you are filled up that you're going to be able to go and do the things that I'm telling you to do. Because you've got to start with a full tank. If, uh, if you're going to go on a trip, you've got to start with a full tank. You, you, you're better off to, to go ahead and fill up the car the night before. So when you pack and you get ready to go that morning, you've got a full tank. You don't want to start out with a quarter of a tank and then have to stop just as soon as you're starting to get some traction and fill up with gas. What, what if you're, when you get to where you're going, you can't find a station if you're in unfamiliar territory. So you fill up, you've got to start with a full tank. Now, as I think about, about church in the last 400 days that, that we have experienced being a church, we haven't had a full tank, have we? Our sanctuary has been uh, half a tank. It's been down as low as a quarter tank. We've had to get by. If you look at the, the financial figures in the budget, you can see that we've been sometimes driving around on fumes. Our numbers have not been as they used to be. So we've got to have a full tank, and I hope that as time goes on and as things continue to open up this year, that we will see these pews fill up, that we will see God's uh, tank fill up, that we will see the, the hand go from, uh, from the last quarter back up to full again. Because that's what took place on Pentecost. It got my attention when I read the very first verse. It said, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. How many people were there? All of them. All the disciples. That means they had perfect attendance. Have we ever had a, a, a Sunday where we had 100% attendance? 100% people came for Sunday school and 100% people came for worship. That would be awesome. And what would happen if we had 100% attendance? Well, on that day, they had 100% attendance. And that is when God blessed them with the Spirit and, and, and things began to move. Um, I also take this to mean uh, another way, that not only were they all together physically, but they were all on the same page. They were all together in the sense that they were together with the same common purpose. They were all of one mind. There was unity in the church. If you've got a church that is well, well attended and that church is united in a, in a common purpose and a common mission, then they're unstoppable. That's what uh, a vehicle that's prepared to get out on the highway and take you somewhere looks like. As I thought about, uh, about the way an engine works, you know, I kept stringing this metaphor along and I realized that there are, are four stages to the way an internal combustion uh, engine works and that, that this metaphor just keeps working as we keep looking at this passage of scripture and thinking about that. There are, are four strokes to a four stroke engine and the first one begins with the intake stroke. With the intake stroke, you've got an intake valve that opens up and that valve opens up to allow the fuel and air to get in there. Uh, scripture says, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It began with, with the air rushing into the church. Uh, the, the, the intake is what allows the, the air and the fuel mixture to, to enter into the engine so that there's something to fuel the mechanism that needs to take place in there. Uh, so we have to begin with, with God. Whatever we do in this church, we have to begin with God. We have to ask through prayer for God to, uh, you know, to, to fill us, to guide us, to shape us. Not only as a church, but on a personal level. It means that we need to open ourselves up. The more we open ourselves up to God, the more God is able to do in our life. If you see the picture in the background of this, this passage, uh, this is a hot rod. And that thing there is a, a hood scoop. And that hood scoop sticks up above the hood because when it's going down the highway, it's trying to catch more wind. Because it's only if it can catch more wind that it can go faster and faster. 
And it's only by opening ourselves up to the movement of God's spirit in our life that God can propel us forward. Sometimes we have a leaky intake, though. I had that problem, too. I shared with you a while back that in the beginning of the pandemic, when my car wasn't being driven as much, I decided to replace my intake because, indeed, I had a leak. When you have a leaky intake, instead of the air and fuel getting in where it's supposed to, well, you've got some leaks that, that, that makes it to where you don't get enough fuel into your engine. And as a result, it doesn't idle very smooth. And then when you're out there on the highway, you don't get as good a gas mileage, which means you're not going as far as you could on the same amount of fuel as you would if you didn't have those leaks. So you got to get rid of those leaks. Sometimes you got to replace that intake to make sure that, that there aren't any leaks. In, uh, in, in our life, God wants our full attention, does he not? But there are so many things that distract us. It's so easy for just a small little leak to open up and cause us to change our priorities and, and God starts to slip from the number one place in our life. And then that leak can get worse and worse. And, and the next thing you know, we're only going to church uh, half as much as we used to. We're only praying and reading our Bibles half as much as we used to. We're not going nearly as far as we used to on that same tank of gas. So it's time to do some maintenance. It's time to patch it up and, and make sure that we're getting the full benefit of God's spirit and presence in our life. That means you got to clean your air filter as well. You, you can have a good intake. Uh, you can have a hood scoop that's trying to cram that air in there. You can have a, a turbocharger that's got a fan that's trying to force that air. But if your air filter is dirty, no, no amount of supercharging is going to overcome the, you know, that clogged up air filter. So uh, that, that means that we've got to, to open up. In Scripture, we see that, that after the resurrection, the disciples spent a lot of time behind locked doors. They, they were behind locked doors right after Easter, and Jesus came and and, and then uh, Thomas missed it, and Jesus came a second time, and they were still locked up behind closed doors. And here they are, they're gathered once again in a room. So on the day of Pentecost, that's when God said, okay, we're going we're gonna to take the air hose, and we're going to blow out this filter. We're going to clear out the clogs. We're going to open up the windows. We're going to open up the doors. We're going to open it up to where the people on the outside of the church can look and see what's going on on the inside of the church. That's what it means to clean your air filters. We need to open ourselves up to God's spirit, but we also need to make sure that we open up the doors of this church, that we make the community uh, aware that God is doing some good things inside this building, that our doors are wide open so that we can welcome those in the community. It means welcoming and receiving those that, that walk in without a judgmental attitude, but letting them know that all are welcome as, as, uh, as we uh, invite people uh, into the sanctuary. All that takes place in the, the intake stroke, but once, once that fuel gets into the chamber, there's a second stroke, and that's the compression stroke. I think of worship as being like that compression stroke. As we pack the pews as tight as we can get them, that's where the potential begins to, to take place. It says, uh, uh, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. So all of a sudden, the, those things that were outside the church began to cram inside the church, and the numbers began to increase. Now, church is, is not just about numbers. Wherever two or more are gathered, Christ promises to be there. But when God's house is full, we get a better image of what the body of Christ looks like. We get uh, invigorated as we encourage one another. We, we are walking uh, more in line with God's will as we have the accountability of, of, of sharing with each other. It invigorates me as a pastor. I'd much rather preach to a packed house than to preach to an empty room. I'd much rather preach in the presence of a crowded, compressed sanctuary than to have to preach to a camera and feel very distant from you. So right now we're experiencing the compression stroke in this, this church as we come together this morning. And see, the thing about the compression stroke, uh, in an engine, the, the, the gasoline goes in there and that piston comes up with all the valves shut and it compresses. That takes the molecules and moves them closer and closer together because when those molecules get together in close proximity, it increases the potential. The potential energy of that fuel is then magnified and our potential is magnified when we come into this worship house and we experience the compression stroke of being crammed together for the power of worship. Scripture says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and do good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. 
So you see, it is through the compression stroke, it is through coming together that it unleashes our potential to do good in this world. It's through coming together in the compression stroke that it unleashes our potential to love one another, to love ourselves, to love God, to love our neighbors that, that we need to welcome. Not only uh, do we need to, to have close proximity with each other, but we need to have close proximity to our, our neighbors as well. That's the point of that, that hood scoop, is to try to draw those things from the outside into the engine where they can experience that, that potential. And, uh, and so we need to think about our neighbors. We need to think about those people that, that could be here right now that aren't. I was just talking about uh, you know, going to the gym in Sunday school with, with Melanie because she asked me if I went this week and I had to confess, no, I didn't make it this week. So see, there's accountability in, in coming together in a Sunday school class. And uh, she was questioning me about how crowded it was. And I said, well, look here in this app, we can see exactly what days are very crowded. And we turned to Sunday, and, and would you believe that between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, there is a spike in attendance at the gym. How sad is that? That people that, that, that could choose to be at church, instead, they're deciding to go to the gym. They want to make their bodies stronger. They don't realize that our physical health and our spiritual health work together. What can we do to, to reach out, to be in close proximity with our neighbors? Because salvation is not just about your own personal salvation it's about wanting that same salvation for the people around you even when the jews were in exile it says in uh, in jeremiah 29 that this was the lord's plan for them it said also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which i have carried you into exile now can you imagine that they're in exile they are surrounded by neighbors that they don't like they are surrounded by neighbors that don't look like them, that don't talk like them, people that they'd rather not associate with. And God is saying, make peace with those people. Not only that, but you need to pray for their prosperity. Because when they prosper, you prosper. We all prosper together. A rising tide raises all boats, right? Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you will prosper. We should be just as concerned with our neighbor's prosperity as we are our own prosperity. And so we need to be in close proximity with our neighbors in order to, uh, to bring about the change that's going to improve our entire community. And then there was a spark. So somewhere between the compression stroke and the next stroke, a spark plug lets off a little blue glow, very subtle, very simple. And that one little spark sets off a chain reaction in that combustion chamber. It ignites all that fuel. And that's what we see happening in Pentecost. Because they were where they were supposed to be, because they were crammed together, because they were drawing in people from the outside, because the compression stroke was so effective, it says, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Because they were in the right place at the right time, because they were in the right position, because they were in the proper firing order, God was able to come in and ignite and light a fire in the church, a fire that, that transformed into power and continues to empower the church today. And that leads us to the very next step here, the power stroke. Each one heard in their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are, are speaking Galileans? And how is it each of us here in their own language? The power stroke, after the compression stroke, once that fuel is ignited, this is what turns that linear uh, energy into rotational motion. This is what gets the wheels moving. And we see here that in the midst of this power stroke of, of the engine of the church, that the key here is communication. It is in the power stroke that the good news is preached. It is in the power stroke that we sing songs proclaiming God's glory. It is in the power stroke that we listen and we pray for one another. It's in the power stroke that we gather, uh, not only on Sundays, but other days of the week for, for Bible study and, and, and God's word is heard. But it's also in the power stroke that we need to continue to think about how we can do a better job of communicating God's will to those outside the church. You know, we, we sometimes get in the habit of just using church language and insider language and we know what we're talking about, but do our neighbors really know? We need to continually be not only embracing the traditions and the heritage of our faith, but also trying to find new ways to communicate, to translate that, that good news in, in such a way that it will be uh, heard by the next generation. That means that it's in the power stroke that we put together a vacation Bible school. It's in the power stroke that we decorate our church and welcome young people. It's in the power stroke that we 
that we uh, operate uh, all the programs of the church. Now, the programs of the church are good, but they are not the church. The programs are only uh, part of the mechanism if they are fueled by God's spirit. If we didn't have any fuel in the tank, if we didn't have God's spirit blessing what we were doing, we could do all the different programs and try all the, the different gimmicks that people try to increase their church, and nothing's going to happen. You're going to have all the right parts, but nothing to get to get it flowing. It takes a combination of, of God's spirit and, and, and programs that then uh, harness that spirit and, and get us moving forward. And that's when rotational motion begins to take place. The wheels begin to turn and we begin to get somewhere. So what took, took place at Pentecost? It, it was the filling of the Holy Spirit. It was the fuel that went into the tank. So the church... Uh, you know, the, you know, the church began to experience the transforming power of the Spirit on that day. And then at the end of all this, Peter basically preaches a sermon trying to explain what's going on. He reads from an Old Testament passage of Joel to try to give some insight into what's happening. And when he gets to the conclusion of, of that sermon, uh, there's an invitation at the end. I don't know if they sang an invitation hymn or not, but it says this. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Those who accepted his message, it goes on to say, were baptized. And then listen to this. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, I don't know how much manpower it, it takes to, to equal one horsepower. Uh, but if it was 3,000 manpower, that's probably at least about 300 horsepower. So you can see just what kind of performance uh, the, the, the engine in, in the vehicle of the church had that day. This is a high-performance machine that Peter preached. He offered the invitation, and 3,000 people were added to their number. That's emotion. You see, the church is a vehicle. It's designed to get people into the new kingdom. The church is not just a stagnant building with a bunch of bricks. That might be the paint job on the outside, but we, the members, we are the engine. And, and if that engine is connected with God, then that is when this, this stagnant uh, you know, building can then get us somewhere. It can get, you know, get people's lives where they need to be. It, there can finally be motion in, in what takes place here. And that leads us to the final stroke, which is the exhaust stroke. Now, what can the exhaust stroke possibly have to do with the church? Well, for that, I need to go back in my memories to childhood. I used to ride around on a moped. I like the moped because unlike a motorcycle, you didn't have to have uh, tags and inspection and all that stuff. I think you might have to have some of that stuff now. But in, in, at least in Virginia, when I was a young person, you didn't have to have all that red tape. You could just hop on a, a moped and ride around town very much in the way that you would hop on a bicycle. In fact, you didn't even have to wear a helmet uh, when I was doing this back in the day. My uh, motorcycle or the mopeds that I was driving, naturally, like everything I had, they were much older than me. You know, I was you know, tinkering on some old stuff. And so it required some, some regular maintenance. And one day I was doing maintenance that in order for me to get to the part I needed to work on, I had to remove the muffler. Just two bolts and a gasket. I gently removed the muffler, laid it aside. Then before you put the thing all the way back together, you want to make sure the repair that you have done has really fixed the problem. So before I put that muffler on, I fired up the moped. Well, I did not realize just how loud that tiny little motor could be with the, with the, the muffler uh, left off of it. And when I, you know, the young person, when I heard that I had to rev it up and listen to the sound of that motor revving, I, in my mind, I had a Harley Davidson. And uh, my neighbors didn't appreciate this too much, but I had to give that thing a test drive and go ride this, this Harley Davidson down the road making a bunch of noise without a muffler on it. So I hop on that thing, and normally, you know, I could, I could do 25 miles an hour, but I got the thing all up to 27 miles per hour. So I've got it full throttle, you know, my head's down, you know, breaking the wind, and I'm just king of the road, making a lot more fuss than I am speed, but having a blast all the same. The exhaust stroke, I think it's time that we make our voice heard outside of this building. And maybe it's time that we make a little bit of noise. Maybe it's time we get our neighbor's attention. Uh, scripture says, grant to your servant to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
And then it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Not only did we see in the day of Pentecost that the Spirit empowers the church, but it gave them some boldness. They made some noise. And as a result, people were saved. The exhaust reminds me of smoke. And where there's smoke, there's fire. You see that exhaust that comes out of your engine is evidence that there was fire in the chamber. And uh, we see other places in Scripture that, that where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, all the way back to the Old Testament, when God's presence was made known to the people as they wandered in the desert, it said, by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a column of smoke to lead them on their way. By night, he went ahead of them in a column of fire to give them light so that they could travel uh, by day or by night. You see, at nighttime, you could see the glowing embers and know that there was something coming out of the tailpipe. And uh, in the daytime, and you couldn't see the fire, you could see the smoke. You could see the evidence that that fire was taking place. What about you? Are you living your life in such a way that you're making smoke? And what I mean by that is, are you living in such a way that people can look at you and they can tell that the fire of the Holy Spirit is inside of you? By the way you're living, is there evidence in your life? What smoke are you producing? We're supposed to be the light of the world. Which means that even at night, people can see the, the, the glow. We're supposed to, supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be, be evidence uh, outside of ourselves that something is going on internally. If we are connected with God's spirit, if we have, are operating with a full tank, if we take off that muffler so that we can speak boldly and act boldly and raven in this world, then people will see and they will know. And, and so that brings me to this final point here. We, we all are part of this engine. Some of us are carburetors. Some of us are, are, are spark plugs. Some of us are the wires that connect the spark plug to the, to the source of, of, of electricity, to the coil, so that, that it can do its job. Some of us are, are linkage. Maybe you connect this part, connect that part. Some of us might be windshield wipers, and our job is to help other people to see more clearly. You can just go on and on as you think about all the different parts, but one thing's for sure, for, for an automobile to get you where it you need to be going and to get you there efficiently and safely. All these parts need to be working together. If, uh, if they aren't, well, you can be stranded on the side of the road. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but we all need to be doing our part to connect with each other and to be doing what God is calling us to do. Uh, Paul didn't have a car to drive back in the day, so instead he said it this way. He said, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you has a part number. Each one of you has a function. Have you ever done repair to your own car? When you get done, you got a, a box of leftover parts and you just throw them over your shoulder and you hope for the best? That's not the kind of chances that God wants us taking with his car. This is not our, our church. This is God's church. You know that? God has entrusted us. God has given us the keys. He had the keys. They belong to him. He said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to toss you my keys and let you take them for a spin. What are, you, what are you going to do with that opportunity? Are you going to be reckless with God's car? Or are you going to drive it like it ought to? Are you going to do the appropriate maintenance by paying attention to it each and every day? Are you going to open up those doors and see how many people you can cram inside that you might be the most effective in, in being a vehicle that gets people into the new kingdom? Think about that. It's time for us all to do some personal maintenance. It's time for us to, to make sure our tanks are full. It's time for us to connect to God's spirit that we might be empowered to do some amazing things. As we prepare to hit the road, let us go to our Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, we are now coming to the end of this service, which means we are entering into the exhaust stage. In the exhaust stage, we file out of this building and out into this world. Just as smoke dissipates, we are going to dissipate by going in our own different directions. Some of us are going to go out to eat. Some of us are going to to go home. Some of us are going to go to jobs tomorrow. and Some of us are going to go to the gym. Wherever we, we go when we leave this place, wherever the journey takes us, whatever road we find ourselves on, Lord, may people look at us and see the evidence of your power in our life. Lord, may we not drive recklessly. May we not drive too fast through this life, but take time to enjoy the scenery. And most of all, take time to pick up that person that needs a ride themselves. Pick up that person with that gas can and say, let me take you to our church and show you just how you can be filled. 
Lord, may we all do our best to keep it in the lane as we follow the guidance of, of, of your Holy Spirit. May you guide our pathway that we might get where you are calling us to go. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We come to the end of our service now. The invitation is extended to you. If you've never accepted the Holy Spirit into your life, if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then come forward as we sing this song, Breathe on Me, and be baptized in this church. Come talk to me about the decision that God is laying on your heart, and I would be glad to counsel you in, in the process. If you're already a baptized believer and would like to join this church and become a part of this vehicle of the faith, we would open up our car door and, and slide right over that you might join us. Come and transfer your membership and, and, and make that decision as well as we sing this song together. Let us stand and sing, Breathe on Me. experiencing your power in here. There have been other parts of the body of Christ that have been serving in different capacities, and one of those is preparing a meal for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we transition from this sanctuary to our family life center, that we, we might be nourished not only by the food that we, uh, we receive, but by your Holy Spirit, as this gathering is not just a meal, but a time of fellowship. Lord, bless the food, bless the hands that have so lovingly prepared, and may we glorify you today. In Christ's name we pray.